Welcome to Westview, where life change happens. Due to unforeseen circumstances, we were unable to give adequate attention to our generosity and stewardship drive for May Tithe Month. Therefore, we have decided to postpone our giving campaign to September, wherein an entire sermon series will be dedicated to understanding the biblical perspective on our relationship to money, stewardship, and tithing. We would like to thank each and every contributing member and attendee at Westview for their sacrificial giving and generosity. May God continue to bless you. Our next Surf Saturday is on the 8th of June. We invite you to join us as we continue to commit ourselves to feeding and caring for those in need in our community. For the more outgoing person, you can join our team and help serve on Saturday morning. We'll meet at Westview at 7.30 before heading to the various locations to set up our soup stations. For those who are shy and may not be able to join us on Saturday, you can make a two litre batch of soup and drop it off at reception by the 7th of June. However you choose to serve, RSVP with Elvis via email. Holiday Club is around the corner. We already have two of the five meals donated and we've raised about 40% of the funds we need. We have a few events planned to assist us with our fundraising efforts and are asking for your support because we cannot do it without you. Our first event is on Friday the 7th of June. We invite you to an evening of mystery and intrigue spiced with suspicion and lies. Join us for our murder mystery evening starting at 6.30. Tickets will be sold at 40 Rand per person. Soup and rolls will also be on sale. Our second event is on Youth Day, the 16th of June. Bring the family and have fun at our family fun day after our 10 o'clock service. Join us for our seven aside netball tournament where you can register your team for 70 Rand. We'll also have games and fun activities for our little ones. Food and snacks will also be on sale. Below is a list of items we need. To donate any of these items, you can drop them off at reception. To make a financial contribution, you're welcome to pay into the Westview Bank account using Holly Club as a reference. For more information on how to donate or our fundraisers, contact Manti or Elvis via email or through the church office. As always, we appreciate your continued support. Please follow us on our Facebook, TikTok and Instagram pages or visit our website at www.westview.org.za. But don't keep us a secret. Share our content with your friends and family. Greetings, friends, and welcome to our worship service. We continue with our series context where we're really trying to locate some of the scriptures that we so well know into their original context. And this day we are going to be talking a little bit about justice. And so as a call to worship, allow me to read for us from the prophet Amos, reading from chapter 5 and just reading verses 23 and 24. The Lord speaks and says, Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll out like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And so join us as we worship God together in song. There's a song of celebration that is ringing round the earth As humanity unites to sing of dignity and worth Out of poverty and anger God is bringing hope to birth Let all creation sing Sing of hope and liberation Sing of justice and salvation Sing with holy indignation let all creation sing It's a song of solidarity, of protest and of pain On behalf of all who suffer for another person's gain It's a call to faith and freedom that will never be in vain Let all creation sing Sing of hope and liberation Justice and salvation Sing with 
Money talks, and power makes the world go around, or so they would have us believe. And we, forgetting that other voice, join the march in hopes that we may find a place among the rich and strong. But you, O God, feel no shame, fear no harm, as you walk among the poorest and weakest, feeling completely at home. Thank you for the voice of your love that keeps singing of the power in weakness, the wealth in simplicity, and the freedom and safety that are found in walking your humble, serving way. When we become confused, O God, and think that we can find security, life and love in what we possess or who we control, please forgive us. When we grow so afraid of the cost that we close our hearts to those in need, forgive us. When we forget that your love extends to everyone and that sharing your love is the only true way to the life and safety we seek, forgive us. Thank you that your grace and generosity, your love and compassion, O God, know no bounds and that you have given us the privilege of participating in your work of justice, mercy, and salvation. As we worship, O Spirit, please fill our hearts to overflowing with love again, and teach us how to carry that love out into our small corner of the world. Amen. Friends, God has given us a vision of a world that is shaped by God's reign of love and justice. It's a vision of hope, but it can only come to be if we are willing to participate in making it happen. And that's where our giving is so important. It reminds us of God's generosity to us. It supports the work of our church in serving those in need. And it teaches us that our small acts of kindness and generosity are our best way to contribute to making God's love and justice more visible in our world. And so as Westview's banking details come up on screen, now and at the end of the service, let's give as generously as we can, and let's commit to sharing God's love and justice in small daily acts of kindness and generosity. Greetings, Westview. Let us give thanks for these tithes and offerings. 
Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that by you all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. You warned us not to store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal, but to store up treasures in heaven. Guard our hearts and may we in bringing our offerings to you now store up treasure in your kingdom. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Jesus Christ, in your powerful name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we bring before you our dear sister Siobhan, who has just uh, undergone an operation. We pray for healing, we pray for strength, we pray for peace. We pray for her son Matthias, as well as her mother Charlene, who at this time continue to care for her. We pray for your blessing upon them. We pray, Lord, that during this time they may feel your presence as well as your blessing in their life. We ask for all of these things in the name of our Lord, Saviour and Friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading today is Mark 14, verse 7. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. We thank God for his word. Friends, one of the most uh, consistent messages of Scripture is this idea that our God is a God who is concerned uh, about justice, that this is a God of justice. But this is also one of the messages and the ideas in the Bible that many of us struggle with. You see, for most of us, we are okay with a God who uh, is concerned about our spiritual lives and our spiritual needs, but the idea of a God who is also concerned about the material conditions of God's people is sometimes a bit uh, daunting and overwhelming for many of us. To be more specific, God cares about the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. And so that idea terrifies if it doesn't scare many of us, because most of us would really like to have a relationship with God that focuses more on what the Bible has to tell us about how to believe in God, how to believe in Jesus, but also about how to save our souls. And so for most of us, that type of understanding, that type of spirituality and theology has more to do with just saving our souls and not caring about the physical needs of other people. Uh, for some of us, we are more comfortable with the idea that God is more concerned with our souls than he is with our physical needs. And so we are drawn more to this idea of a Jesus who cares more about our souls than a Jesus who cares about transforming our society. And so part of what we'll be doing with this uh, message is to begin to just talk about this idea of a God who is for justice. And as the book of the prophet Amos says, one of the things that God directs is for us to be people who strive for justice. Now, in Mark 14, which is really our scripture focus for today, Jesus' disciples are angry about an unnamed woman who uses a jar of expensive oil to anoint Jesus' head in an act of extravagant love and devotion to Jesus. 
Their frustration is grounded in what they called the wasting of resources. The ointment could have been sold, they say, and the proceeds given to the poor. Jesus responds to the disciples with what on the surface seems to be a cold and an uncaring response in her defense. He tells the disciples not to trouble this woman because, again, you will always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. Now, this passage, you will always have the poor amongst you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. This passage has often been referenced in response to preaching and teaching about God's concern for the poor. This passage has been translated to mean that having the poor or having pure, poor people amongst us is part of some divine necessity. In other words, this somehow suggests that there are those amongst us who are destined to be poor by God. But if we place these words back into their context in the Gospel of Mark, is it maybe possible that something else is happening in this passage? Now, one of the things to say about Mark is that Mark is the first of our New Testament Gospels, is the first one to be written. But Mark is also the shortest of all four of the New Testament Gospels, which also then means that Mark moves with a certain agency and action in telling the story of who Jesus is. And so locating this text in its context reveals to us that in its historical context, it is Ash Wednesday, we are in the middle of the liturgical time that we as Christians know as Holy Week. It is the final week of Jesus' life and the tension around Jesus' message is growing more and more. And so the story then begins in the home of a person named Simon, and Simon is identified in the text as a leper, a term that indicates some sort of skin disease that would have caused anyone afflicted to be kept isolated and at a distance. Now, we don't know anything about this Simon who plays host to Jesus in this particular text. We don't even know whether he was currently dealing with his disease or whether he had dealt with this disease in the past and was now cured. We have no way of knowing whether at this moment Simon is suffering from the disease or not. However, that becomes insignificant because what we know about Jesus means that his presence in Simon's home is not a surprise to us because you would remember, you would know that being in the spaces where other people would not choose to be is a typical Jesus thing to do. In other words, whether Simon is sick or not, Jesus would be seen in his house. And we know that from just how Jesus has dealt with other people who have been outcasted from society. However, this particular scene is a bit different from the usual scenes where Jesus shares a meal with unsavory characters. Normally, a meal with Jesus would be a celebratory environment enacting the kingdom of God by sharing the basic necessities of life, all gifts from God, including food and drink. But this particular meal is different. The vibe during this Holy Week has changed. It has moved from the jubilation of Palm Sunday to now a rising concern among Jesus' followers, but also a rising concern amongst those who regard themselves as enemies of Jesus. For those who follow Jesus and are his friends and disciples, 
the kingdom of God has not appeared as they had expected it to appear, at least according to their Hebrew scriptures, but also according to how Jesus was busy proclaiming this kingdom in his ministry. In fact, Jesus has been met with fierce comp competition as well as opposition from those in power. His kingdom message was causing a stay during an already tense season of Passover. In that whole complicated situation scenario, suddenly a woman enters. She is unnoticed at first. That is until the room is hushed to silence as she breaks open the expensive jar of perfume and pours it on Jesus' head. Now, Mark's readers would have immediately understood the significance of such an event. You see, someone being anointed in this way was full of meaning, all of which would have been controversial in this setting. Here's another thing that is important for us to remember. Christ is not actually Jesus' last name, but Christ is a title that is given to Jesus. It is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew word that gives us Messiah in English. And so then, the literal translation is the Anointed One. This unnamed woman is now making a bold claim about Jesus through this act of pouring wine of pouring perfume on his head. She's also stepping into a role which is usually reserved for a prophet because it was the responsibility of a prophet to anoint the person who would become the next king of Israel. By anointing Jesus, this woman takes up the mantle of a prophet who has been given insight from God to understand who Jesus really is. As this is happening, the disciples were stunned and they immediately began to criticize the woman's action. They, their frustration was projected as a concern for the poor. Surely it would have been better or it would have been a better decision to sell this perfume and give to the poor, they say. And then Jesus' answer to the disciples' suggestion that the ointment should be, sold, should be sold and the proceeds be given to the poor is not original to Jesus. You see, Jesus quotes from the Hebrew scriptures. And so the first line is a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15. This chapter of Deuteronomy contains the law that focuses on the Sabbath year, which meant among other things, that every seventh year there would be a remission of debts in Israel. And so anyone who owed someone else a debt would have that debt forgiven. The Sabbath year was kind of a mini jubilee, which was an even larger societal economic reset during which anyone who had sold or lost their family land to indebtedness would receive what they had lost back. The purpose of such provisions was to ensure that if followed, the gap between the rich and the poor would not expand unchecked and that there would not always be endlessly poverty. However, if not followed, there would always be some who are poor and the command then was to care for them generously. This then is the context of the verse Jesus quotes in Mark 14. From Deuteronomy 15 verse 11 we read, Since there will never cease to be some in need on earth, I therefore command you, Open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. 
Now notice that this is not a command that there will always be someone in need, but it is actually an acknowledgement that such people do exist. The command that follows is a call to be generous with those in need. It is not a divine decree that poverty exists, but it is a divine mandate to provide care for those who are struggling. And so what does this story of Jesus being anointed by an, an unnamed woman have to do with the surrounding story about the plot against Jesus that is beginning to unfold in the Gospel of Mark? You see, Jesus' quotation of Deuteronomy 15 is accompanied by a statement that is meant to critique the attitude of his disciples. Jesus says to them, for you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. In other words, Jesus pushes back on his disciples' critique not by saying that the poor do not matter or discouraging the care for the poor. Instead, he is getting at the core of his kingdom vision, which was grounded in justice and jubilee. When Jesus quoted this text, his disciples would very likely have understood the larger context of Deuteronomy 15, that it was not a command to enact charity, but a command to practice justice. Now, those two things are different, charity and justice. You see, charity is almost like a band-aid solution to the problem of poverty. It helps a person or a group of people in the moment, which is wonderful, but it fails to address the root causes of the problem. Now, that is exactly what Deuteronomy 15 is addressing, getting to the roots of poverty and ensuring that the poor will not always be with us. Because the systems and the structures that create poverty have been dismantled and addressed. And so then, Jesus' message and movement were all centered on the least, the forgotten, the excluded, the oppressed, and the marginalized. He is not discouraging his disciples then and now from caring about the poor. He is in fact calling his disciples then and now to do more than just the random acts of charity, but instead to transform the systems that create poverty for some in the first place. Jesus' reference to Deuteronomy 15 is not a call to do less for the poor, but it is a call to do more to transform unjust systems into something just and equitable. As I have said before, one of Mark's central themes is the failure of Jesus' disciples to recognize who Jesus is. And so we can sum up the failures of the disciples throughout Mark's narrative as a failure of imagination. You see, at the core, the problem for them is that they just cannot imagine the world that Jesus is proclaiming and creating as being a possibility. The issues were too big for them and they saw themselves as being too small and too few. Rome was too big and too powerful for them. So when Jesus told stories about an upside down kingdom, about this counterintuitive kingdom that was not somewhere else but was right here and available right now, they could not totally understand how it would unfold. And so when large crowds followed them into the, into the wilderness and needed food, they thought that it was an impossible task to provide a meal. Even when Peter thought, or even when Peter rightly identifies Jesus as the Christ, only a few verses later then, Jesus rebukes him 
for saying that he would suffer and die at the hands of the authorities when Peter rebukes Jesus. But the most daring moment came when Jesus was betrayed by one of the twelve, and all the rest abandoned him, and Peter again denied him. You see, they just could not trust the world that Jesus was seeking to create was a possibility in the context of Roman occupation. Yet this unnamed woman in chapter 14 becomes for Jesus the model disciple who does have the capacity for imagination. This is someone who gets the vision. This is someone who catches the vision of Jesus. And so is it not interesting that it is right after this woman anoints Jesus and his celebration of this woman that, Jesus, that Judas decided to betray Jesus. And so the question really that we may want to ask ourselves is, what was it about this moment that flipped the switch for Judas? Could it be that in this moment, that this moment was the first time that Judas really understood Jesus' message and that it was not the revolution he thought he was joining. You see, this unnamed woman will be remembered differently. She understood that Jesus would be broken and poured, just like the jar of perfume. So she prepared him for burial in advance. This was an act of kindness, compassion, human dignity, courage, and faith. By anointing Jesus, she shows the capacity to imagine the different kind of world that Jesus announced and that his suffering would not be the end of the vision of the kingdom of God. Now, we end by reminding ourselves that taking a random line of scripture out of context and then using it to argue against caring for the poor does a lot of harm. As we have seen, Jesus' quotation of Deuteronomy 15 was an invitation to his disciples to join him in imagining a more just world in which there was no poverty, a world that could be made real not through violence, but through embracing the vision of the Sabbath year or the Jubilee. We've also seen two different responses to that invitation. Judas and this unnamed woman give us an option to decide which person's action we will imitate. If we take Jesus seriously today, that means grappling with the difficult questions that his message evokes. And so we should be asking ourselves, how will we use our resources individually and collectively? Are we willing to be inconvenienced personally to see real change in society? Do we believe it can happen that the world become a just and an equitable place? Could we really cultivate that kind of reality? Not unless we can imagine it, and not unless we are willing to act courageously and generously, just like this woman. It seems that Jesus was right about her, because we are still telling her story today, and she is still remembered as an example of faithful discipleship. You see, change begins in the imagination and then it enters the real world when you and I decide to act. But making change real requires our participation. And so may you and I, like this woman, unnamed yet celebrated wherever the good news is announced, understand the challenge and the vision of Jesus and may you and I use our energy, our creativity and our courage to make this kingdom 
vision, a reality. May God bless us as we think and ponder about this message. Amen. Friends, the poverty, injustice and need in our world can be overwhelming and it can be tempting to turn away. After all, we all have struggles and challenges that we must face. But before we go back into our daily routines, let's give God's word a chance to settle into our hearts and lives. Let's begin with a short meditation. Still yourself and become aware of God's spirit moving within you and around you. And now consider these words from Reverend Mvume Dandala. The opposite of poverty is not wealth, it is dignity. The opposite of poverty is not wealth, it is dignity. And now think of one way that you can treat everyone you meet this week, especially those who are suffering the indignity of poverty and injustice, with respect and dignity. Let's spend a few moments in silence as we reflect on that. And now I invite you to consider the following questions and to carry them with you into this week. Are you willing to be inconvenienced personally to see real change societally? How have you refused to be inconvenienced in the past because you were too comfortable? And what discomfort might God be calling you to embrace now for the sake of others? And then how do your actions show that you believe that the world can become a just and equitable place? What can you do this week to help make God's love and justice a little more visible in your world? Spend a few moments with those questions. And now let's remember and commit to God's call to be people of love and justice as we sing together. Send us out, Lord, we must go, 
Live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward. Keep us from just singing, move us into action. We must go. So friends, we come now to the end of our time of worship together. Let's share God's grace and love with each other as we greet one another. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. And now as we go out into the rest of our week, let's continue to love and serve Jesus by loving and serving those around us. And may God bless you as you do this. Mm -hmm.